Uh, okay, so with me right now is Professor Peter Hagelstein, Research Laboratory for Electronics here at MIT. You've been working in this field of low energy nuclear reactions for more than 30 years. So a lot has happened. Uh, could you briefly give us an overview of what's happened, uh, Pons and Fleischmann uh, controversy in 1989? Yeah, Fleischmann Pons stood up, claimed excess heat in their electrochemical cell. Um, initially, there was some optimism. People went to the labs to try things out. There's also skepticism because based on theory, there would be no reason to expect to see anything. Um, Fleischmann argued that the uh, effect um, had to be nuclear. Uh, so much energy was produced that if it was chemical, you would see chemical byproducts, but they didn't see chemical byproducts. On the other hand, if you make nuclear energy, you get nuclear radiation, but there was no signature uh, commensurate nuclear radiation. Nevertheless, Fleischmann argued that perhaps fusion is happening in a new way, uh, DD fusion. Um, Deuteron's got neutron, proton, two nucleons, the other one's got two nucleons. Two plus two come together, typically go to three and one. And, um, you mean a tritium plus a neutron? A tritium plus a proton, a neutron plus a helium three. So those occur with roughly 50-50 probability in um, experiments that have been done previously. Uh, the theory for it was worked out ages and ages ago. And um, four body problem in nuclear physics is one of the problems is reasonably well, if not extremely well understood. And there's not much doubt about what happens when two deuterons come together, either energetically or come together having been in close proximity. And so when Fleisch and Hans were arguing that he was getting the energy, probably getting the helium four. Two deuterons coming together make a helium four and the energy going into heat. Uh, this did not sit well with nuclear physicists who wanted to see energetic particles coming out. Uh, but there weren't the energetic particles coming out. So this provided a basis for skepticism, uh, extreme skepticism. And um, cold fusion, the excess heat effect, uh, was rejected largely because of the theoretical arguments. Um, the claim was made that the experiment was not reproducible. Um, however, by now there have been hundreds, if not thousands, of observations of excess heat in systems, something like the Fleisch and Pons experiment, but greatly generalized. So you wanted to know what happened afterwards, uh, a few years afterwards, Mel Miles and collaborators, uh, Miles, Bush, and Lukowski, measured helium in the off gas, um, which correlated with the power cells which produce excess heat, uh, correlated with measurements of uh, helium-4. Cells that didn't produce any heat didn't show uh, helium-4. We found out years later that Fleischmann had made such observations. Um, but through all of the attacks and so forth, he decided not to put that on the table as another issue for him to get beat up uh, about. Um, subsequent measurements of uh, healing correlated with heat uh, appeared to confirm the effect discovered by initially Fleischmann and Miles and Bush and Lugowski. Um, I was very impressed by an experiment of Daniel Godsey in which um, heat bursts were observed and helium bursts were observed time correlated with the heat bursts. Another issue is whether there's enough um, helium to correspond to the energy measure. And in the experiments of both Bell Miles and of uh, Godsey, the amount of helium seen wasn't quite enough to account for the heat uh, observed if you assume that all of the energy was from mass difference between D2 and helium 4. And um, this was especially telling for the Gotzi experiment, where the amount of heat and helium correlation, uh, the helium was short by 30% one, one burst, 90% uh, another burst, 50% another burst. And scratching my head thinking, why in the world would that be? And um, 
and Mike McCubrey was sitting next to me. Mike says, oh, it's obvious. Uh, some of the helium is sticking in the metal. Um, uh, Gotzi was asked later on whether that was his conclusion in the talk, and, and uh, the report back was that, that he hadn't thought about that. So this, this uh, explanation tribute to McCubrey. So when you say sticking in the metal, are you saying that helium is stuck within the lattice of the palladium? Okay, the way helium works is helium gets trapped by electron density. So if you have a glass background electron density, if you have glass, glass isn't insulated, there's not lots of electrons around those pathways through low electron density, so helium will go through glass very easily. If you have uh, iron or you have steel, the background electron density is very high, so the helium doesn't go through it very well. In palladium, the background, it's a metal, so the background electron density is reasonably high. Mm -hmm. So uh, helium has trouble going through palladium or other metals uh, to get out. So in the case of um, the Flesch and Pons experiment and the replications where the helium was tested and, and sensed for, um, the um, the helium had trouble getting out. The idea is that helium can come out from distances of micron or two from the surface yeah. in the time scale that's uh, relevant. And um, basically not all of it managed to come out. There's traps for, uh, for the helium. Mm -hmm. So McCubrey did an experiment where he measured excess heat in a leak tight, helium leak tight uh, experiment. He got 60 some odd percent of the helium to come out. He said, well, I want to get the rest of it out, so to scrub it out, he tried to bring the, uh, to have the deuterium come out of the cathode, helping them to drag the helium along, so that got a few more percent of it. And then he thought, well, okay, let's just heat it up in situ. So he heated it up in situ, and more helium came out. And by the time the uh, total inventory was done, nearly the Expect, theoretically expected amount, of course, when the heat was observed. So that was an important measurement. We need more examples of important measurements like that. Resources have prevented uh, uh, further experiments. There's been only one other where an attempt was made to observe helium and to scrub it out. It was made by Vittoria Violanti and colleagues of Enya Fiscott. And they basically got the same result. We got a very close match with an experimental error, the amount of healing you would expect it based on the amount of energy uh, produced. So, so pe people have done a lot of other experiments. They work with metals other than palladium. Uh, palladium is more expensive than gold, and uh, if you're going to have commercial applications, you need uh, cheaper metals. Um, in 1990, 91, Randall Mills did an experiment where uh, the electric chemistry was done in light water, the flesh and plants was done in heavy water, deuterium went into palladium. Mills put hydrogen into nickel, and in this case, he claimed to see excess heat, which was shocking and stunning because people oftentimes said, well, hydrogen was supposed to be a control for palladium, you didn't get excess heat with applied hydrogen. Except that if you asked Fleischmann, Fleischmann would say, most of the time you don't get excess heat because he'd apparently seen some excess heat bursts with uh, light water, uh, so it wasn't an ideal control. Um, subsequently, other people did experiments with nickel and light water, and other metals in light water as well, and saw excess heat out of events. So people saw excess heat with titanium, with tungsten, um, I forgot which other ones, it's been a long conference. Um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, Piantelli, back in the early 1990s, did experiments with hydrogen gas and a nickel bar. Basically, nickel doesn't absorb much hydrogen, so he would let the hydrogen in, a little bit would be absorbed, then he would pump it out. They would let it in again, a little bit more would be absorbed, presumably because defects were being made in the nickel. They would do it half a dozen to a dozen times, and the solubility would go up to about a percent or two of the hydrogen get absorbed in the nickel. And then he'd be ready to get excess heat. So in his protocol, he would drop the temperature and then raise the temperature, which would have the uh, hydrogen go in and then come back out. But in the experiments with the flesh and pause experiment, 
um, a flux of deuterium was observed to trigger, trigger exocene. The same basic thing seems to happen in the Antelli experiment with the hydrogen and nickel bar. It's a very, very different experiment, but the protocol is uh, analogous to what is being used with SRI in their existing experiments. Um, the Antelli group had discussed observations in the early 2000s in which a bar worked sufficiently well but once they kicked it on and then they did their hydrogen flux thing again and again and again to try to boost up the rate of excess heat. They managed to get somewhere in the neighborhood of 270 C. Um, the bar was producing something in the neighborhood of 70 watts for roughly eight months. They had um, five or six bars that showed multiple month sustained operation. Now uh, input power was, was the report that we had on uh, Bill Collins of one of the conferences who had been working with or interacting with uh, the Intel group. Um, so that's a lot of experiments. Yeah. Um, in some cases, low energy net their emissions would be seen in the fusion products of neutrons at 2.45 mm. So ultra-cold neutrons. No, 2.45 mAb okay. the normal DD fusion okay. neutron energy. Sure. Uh, three uh, MeV protons, um, tritons at 1 MeV, helium-3 at 850 keV or so. Um, in addition to the normal DD fusion products at low levels, um, uh, 10 orders of magnitude or more, less than the rate which would correspond to the energy production uh, associated with excess heat. Um, also, energetic neutrons would be seen. So, um, Rusetsky at the Lebedev Institute got evidence in CR39 experiments for energetic neutrons. Um, uh, more recently, uh, Pam Voss, Larry Forrest, and colleagues have seen the effect again and again and again. Um, basically, the energetic neutron will come in and it will hit a carbon uh, nucleus and blasted into three alphas, and uh, the tracks from that can be seen. So we, we, we know um, with some confidence that, that they're actually there and it's happening. Um, she thought that they might be from DT uh, reactions. Uh, Rusetsky, in his measurements, went, ahead, went through a calculation of the number of tritons produced uh, 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 consistent with the measurements they did and taking the DD, DT, DDT um, fusion cross-section into consideration could calculate how many energetic neutrons, secondary energetic neutrons there should be. And they were order magnitude, orders of magnitude less than what they observed. So he was of the opinion, I'm of the opinion of this new process. I think what's going on in this case is that the energy from the DD, the service from DD going even for the 24 MeV, it's getting transferred to the host metal nucleus. Mm -hmm. So in this case, um, an alpha or neutron or proton is being dug out of palladium, or if it's on a nickel, it will get dug out of nickel or titanium. And um, this gets seen in, uh, in some of the experiments that, where they have detectors appropriate to look for low level signals of that sort. Um, people have also seen transmutation. So I first became aware of some claims in connection with experts by John Dash, where he would notice in palladium experiments there would be hot spots where the palladium showed signs of having melted, and there would be elemental anomalies in the hot spots. So you would see calcium and silicon and, and uh, zirconium, um, iron, various elements that weren't there when they started. So everyone said, aha, it's, uh, it's contamination, uh, obvi obviously a uh, uh, contamination, which, which is, of course, uh, you know, a, a possibility. So you do more experiments. Uh, what you'd like to do is to check for isotopic anomalies, the resources have been short. So the uh, uh, isotopic, uh, you, you'd like to know if the isotopic uh, ratios differ from the, uh, the natural. And um, in, in a small number of measurements that have been done, this, this in fact has been found. 
um, in, in the Piantelli experiments, some analysis of the surface I've heard, the Piantelli experiments seems to, by the way they work, uh, disintegrate many of the host lattice nickel uh, nucleon, uh, much more so in the palladium. It's a little bit like in bulk palladium, away from those hot spots, there are a few signs of uh, transmutations or elemental anomalies. In the hot spots, something different happened, something went wrong, and um, the palladium appears to have been uh, disintegrated. In the Piantelli experiment, it's almost like the Piantelli experiment is all hot spots of the palladium. So the thing self-sustains in a way that chews up the nickel. And so the, the nickel regions look physically different, and when an elemental analysis gets done, new elements are seen. So in, in this case, um, uh, the Piantelli group published data where working with a nickel uh, system, they would see some cobalt, which is an element lower than a nickel. They would see some iron, which is two elements lower, two Cs, two charges less than nickel. They see manganese, they would see chromium, they see macromounts, macroscopic amounts of these uh, uh, as, as products. So this is um, a signature of a, a massive uh, nuclear disintegration of the nickel. And these bars, when they would take them out of the reactor, and the reactor was just a vacuum system where they would put in hydrogen gas, and the nickel would be immersed in hydrogen gas. A little bit less in the atmosphere, they'd raise the temperature, and that would be their chamber. So at the end of the experiment, they would move the hydrogen out, they'd remove the bar, and it would be emitting alpha particles and, and protons. They put it in a cloud chain and see lots of tracks for about 10 minutes or so. Um, and the thought is that uh, there was still some hydrogen in, which would be diffusing through the system. And so these reactions would continue for a short time and give rise to these large signals, which would be connected with the um, transmutation. If you have alpha emission from nickel, you're going to end up with a minor proton emission, you're going to end up with cobalt. So 